Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 741 for November 25th, 2018. Coming up in just a few minutes. The city hall behind us was a depot for powers. Just down the road, we have our old bottling hall, and just up the road, we have our uh, distillery. And in between that, there are bars and, uh, and places of significance to powers. The idea between the powers quarter was just to, sh- I suppose, expose people to that. Jameson may have the global reputation when it comes to Irish whiskey, but until just a couple of years ago, Powers was Ireland's most popular Irish whiskey. Of course, they're both part of the Irish distillers family, but when Ireland's last three whiskey-making families joined forces back in the mid-1960s to survive, they made the decision to export Jameson worldwide and sell Powers at home with the goal of exporting powers once the Irish whiskey market stabilized. Now, with Irish whiskey sales booming once again, that pledge is being realized with increasing exports of powers. And at home in Dublin, there's now the Powers Quarter, a neighborhood of pubs between the Power family's old Johns Lane Distillery and their former bottling hall in Dublin's Smithfield neighborhood. We'll take a look at the history of Powers later on WhiskeyCast In-Depth. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, the calendar of events, your voice, and much more, all on this episode of WhiskeyCast. WhiskeyCast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. This is Whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch Whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Let's begin with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. And we'll begin with the latest on Brexit. British Prime Minister Theresa May has worked out a compromise with the leaders of the other European Union member nations on an exit agreement. They signed off on the deal Sunday in Brussels, calling it, quote, the best and only deal possible. But that was the easy part compared to the issues May still faces at home. The British Parliament is scheduled to vote up or down on the deal December 12th, and the Prime Minister faces growing opposition that could bring down her government. The compromise will keep Great Britain in the European single market until the end of 2020, while a long-term trade deal is being negotiated, and the so-called backstop designed to protect the open border between Ireland and Northern Ireland could extend that period indefinitely if no deal is reached. That's being viewed as good news for the Irish whiskey industry, according to Walsh Whiskey Company founder Bernard Walsh. Nobody, North or South, want a hard border because we've lived, uh, you know, it's uh, 20 years now without uh, a hard border, without military posts and people with guns pointing down at you because you want to just go and visit your cousin in Belfast. And both sides of the community up there and down here just like the fact that we can move freely and we want that to continue. Uh, Nobody wants to see a return to dark days. Um, And, you know, by putting a hard border, we're giving an excuse to the extremists and we don't want to do that. Arlene Foster heads up Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party and the DUP's support in Parliament is the only reason May was able to form a majority government after the last election. Foster told the BBC the agreement leaves Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK stuck within European structures with no say in its rules. And her members will not only vote against it, but will review the coalition with May's Conservative Party if the deal goes through. Scottish leaders are equally upset. First Minister and Brexit opponent Nicola Sturgeon wants Parliament to consider other alternatives to the deal. That deal also has to be ratified still by the European Council and Europe's Parliament. Those votes are expected early next year. 
While all of this has been playing out, one of the distillery projects being planned in Northern Ireland is being scrapped. We've reported before on Niche Drinks founder Kieran Mulgrew's plans to build a distillery for the Quiet Man Irish Whiskey at the Old Naval Yard in Londonderry. Mulgrew's longtime partner, U.S.-based Luxco, was also part of the project after buying a majority stake in Niche Drinks earlier this year. This week, Mulgrew confirmed to us in text messages that the project is being scrapped a year after construction had begun. He declined our request for an interview, but cited commercial reasons as the justification for the move. Mulgrew told us the Quiet Man whiskeys will still be produced using their existing stocks of whiskey, but he did not respond to other questions about the future of the Quiet Man brand. Meanwhile, Wisconsin's Death's Door Spirits opened the doors to the courthouse Wednesday, filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Death's Door was known mostly for its gin and vodka, but also produced whiskeys. Founder Brian Ellison told Madison.com this week that he had been looking for new investors or a buyer since the distillery's long-term distribution deal with Seralis USA fell apart. Seralis USA is the distillery's largest creditor with $3.6 million in debt out of a total of $5.2 million in liabilities. Death's Door could be on the auction block within the next month in a court-supervised sale. Also on the business front, Heaven Hill Distillery has announced plans to invest $65 million in its facilities in Bardstown, Kentucky, including a major renovation and expansion of the Heaven Hill Bourbon Heritage Center. That center opened back in 2004 and was one of the earliest whiskey visitors centers in Kentucky. It draws around 60,000 visitors each year. There's no word on the timetable or the expansion, and the overall project will also include new barrel warehouses and upgrades to Heaven Hill's bottling facility in Bardstown, along with other upgrades. Let's talk about new whiskeys now. Black Friday has come and gone, and so has the Whiskey Exchange's second annual Black Friday single malt. It was an 18-year-old single malt from an undisclosed Orkney distillery. 1,400 bottles went on sale Friday morning and disappeared within a few hours. If you're lucky, you might find one gift-wrapped during the holidays, but more likely you'll find it on the secondary market, priced at nothing close to the list £69.95 that the whiskey exchange was selling it for. That's around 90 bucks a bottle. Another Black Friday release to mention, Douglas Lang & Company is out with the third and final release of the Scallywag Red-Nosed Reindeer Speyside Blended Malt. This one is a 12-year-old blended malt with just 450 bottles available exclusively through the Douglas Lang website at 65 pounds each. Glen Goyne has released its sixth teapot dram, it gets its name from the teapot that some of the distillery's workers once used to share their daily drams with their colleagues. This one is a cask strength single malt matured in Oloroso sherry casks. It's available only at the distillery's visitors center and the Glen Goyne website for 90 pounds a bottle. Ireland's Dingle Distillery has released its second single pot still whiskey. It's the fifth overall bottling from Dingle and will be available in Ireland and a handful of export markets for around 90 euros a bottle. That's about $102 U.S. at current exchange rates. Meanwhile, Buffalo Trace is releasing the latest OFC vintage bourbon next month. It's a 25-year-old 1993 vintage bourbon that's a follow-up to the first retail OFC releases earlier this year. The price tag? $2,500 each. The Jewish Whiskey Company's Single Cask Nation is expanding its independent bottling business. Founders Joshua Hatton and Jason Johnstone Yellen will be expanding their retail sales into more U.S. states during 2019, along with their first forays into Canada, the U.K., and Europe. 
That expansion will come at a cost, though. They have decided to mothball their Whiskey Jubilee Festival Series. Joshua and Jason said they hated to do it, but need to set the festivals aside to be able to expand the business. They started producing the Whiskey Jubilee in New York City back in 2012, after Whiskey Advocate magazine decided that year to hold its annual Whiskey Fest New York on a Friday night, which made it impossible for Jews who observe the Sabbath to attend. The festival became an annual highlight for New York City whiskey lovers of all faiths and expanded in recent years to Chicago and Seattle. Finally, Christie's is preparing for two major whiskey auctions, Their London auction this Wednesday and Thursday features one bottle that could challenge the current world record for a single bottle of whiskey sold at auction. It's a 60-year-old Macallan 1926 with a bespoke label painted by Irish artist Michael Dillon from the same tranche of whiskeys that includes the current record holder, another 1926 Macallan with a label by Italian artist Valerio Adami, at $1,107,000. Adami and Sir Peter Blake produced labels for 12 bottles each of that tranche, while the Dillon bottle is a -a one-of-a-kind hand-painted bottle. On December 7th, Christie's will auction off a collection of pre-prohibition whiskeys in New York City. Those whiskeys were stored in secret vaults built by Jean-Baptiste Leonis at a Los Angeles mansion and were discovered during a renovation project last year. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. The holiday season is here now, and if you want to give a gift that makes an impression, why not give that special person a bottle of Highland Park's classic 18-year-old? For years, it's been regarded as one of the world's best whiskeys, and I'll guarantee you it's one they won't even think of returning. Find out more at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. Buffalo Trace Distillery kicks off its annual holiday celebrations this Thursday night with the lighting of the trace at the distillery in Frankfort, Kentucky. Maker's Mark Distillery has its annual candlelight tours on December 1st and 8th. And Dublin's Teeling Whiskey Company will light the Newmarket Square Christmas tree on December 5th. Whiskey Fest New York is coming up on Tuesday, December 4th. The Whiskey Extravaganza wraps up its fall series of events in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, December 6th. Whiskey Live Athens is December 14th and 15th in the Greek capital. Bonhams has its final whiskey auction of the year in Edinburgh, Scotland, December 12th, and McTeers wraps up its year on the 21st in Glasgow. Right now, we have 116 different events worldwide on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a festival, a tasting, or any other whiskey-related event coming up, just use the contact form on our website to let us know about it, and we'll be glad to add it to the list. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place, and these places in that place. These are the people that make it. This is what they sound like. Because you're a cheeky wee blighter. Dance like, I like that. This is what they do all day. Building the great character of Johnny Walker Black Label. Aging Hickey Oak for 12 long years. Thanks. Oh, it's gorgeous there. Oh. What is character? It's giving a damn. You're not right, lassie. Which looks like this, as much as this. See, the land that shapes these people and the people that shape this whiskey all shape how bloody good it tastes. Not the bloody game in the telly, Alan. A whiskey as bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Cup, cup. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume, imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast In-Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. 
Here's a question for you. What Irish whiskey is the biggest seller in Ireland? If you answered Jameson, you're right. But that's only been the case in the last couple of years. For most of the last five decades since the Power family, the Jameson family, and Cork's Murphy family merged their companies to form Irish distillers back in 1965, Powers was the number one selling Irish whiskey in Ireland and was widely known as the Irish whiskey, the Irish drink. We've told the story several times over the years of how the three families went from being bitter rivals to working together in a last-ditch attempt to save a failing Irish whiskey industry. At the time, they picked Jameson as their export champion and put all of their resources behind it worldwide while keeping Powers as their flagship domestic whiskey. There was always a goal that once Jameson was stable, the other whiskeys would follow in the export markets. And gradually, the Powers' presence has grown outside of Ireland, especially in the U.S. You may recall my delight a few weeks ago when Pernod Ricard announced that Powers 3 Swallow is now available in the U.S., after only being sold in Ireland since it was introduced three years ago. Earlier this month, I spent a few days in Ireland with the Powers Whiskey U.S. team and their colleagues in Dublin, where they've created the Powers Quarter. The oak makes a lot of Irish coffee, and it's not as simple as just adding a dram of whiskey to your cup. <laughs> Start off with boiling water to get the glass properly warmed up. A bit of sugar, then the coffee. I only made it like five, ten minutes ago. Just keep it in the flask for convenience. I say convenience, and then it doesn't work. Then the whiskey, Powers Gold Label, of course. Yeah. One ounce of whiskey. Uh, 35.5. I think that works out about one ounce is 30 mils, so slightly more. Followed by the cream. Pour it lovingly over a spoon into the glass so it settles on top. They didn't invent the Irish coffee at the Oak, but you could argue that they did perfect it here. It's dripping history, which is, you know, it's kind of what you want in a Dublin pub. You know, I, I personally love a bar that has a story because as Irish people, we're full of stories. Um, and we like to have stories around us all the time. Um, and when you have good bartenders like Keelan here, who's able to make a good drink, uh, mix a good cocktail, and um, tell a good story. You can't really go wrong. Michael Carr is the Powers Global Brand Ambassador and perhaps the mayor of the Powers Quarter. The centre of Dublin City, and especially the south side of Dublin City, was the home of Powers. Um, just sitting here and looking out the window, um, John Power was the Sheriff of Dublin which means he would have operated uh, from Dublin Castle as the Sheriff of Dublin. He was actually elected twice to be Sheriff of Dublin. The City Hall behind us was a depot for Powers. Just down the road we have our old bottling hall and just up the road we have our uh, distillery. And in between that there are bars and, uh, and places of significance to Powers. The idea between the Powers Quarter was just to, sh I suppose, expose people to that. Um, I suppose the conception or the preconception of Powers is that it's a country whiskey in Ireland and we just want to bring Powers home. It's great as a walking tour for tourists, but it's really, really focused at dubs and Dubliners so that they can, I suppose, learn a little bit of their history, you know. So that's, that's the idea behind the Powers Quarter. You don't need a brand home when Dublin is your home, do you? That's the idea, yeah. We, we, like, we don't have a visitor centre we can bring people. So let's make Dublin our visitor centre where we can bring people, you know. Um, to be fair, uh, on the beer side of it, Guinness have done that very, very well over the years, even though they do have a wonderful brand home. Dublin City is their brand home. Part of the experience of, of visiting Guinness is going from a pub in the city to Guinness. And maybe our idea is a little bit like that, where we, uh, we, we, we're bringing you into our different establishments, these places that reflect who we are. Get out of the oak, turn right, and start walking. You'll soon find yourself on Thomas Street, where the Powers story started. James Power was an innkeeper on Thomas Street in the late 1700s, and Irish distiller's archivist Carol Quinn says, like most innkeepers of the day, he set up shop 
just outside the walls of the city. Dublin was the centre of authority in Ireland. So that's where the laws were made. That's where, you know, the police force were based. That's where the government was based. Uh, You kind of have to do things by the book when you're that way down. When you come over this way on the other side of the wall, which is where powers were located, and as you remember, it was a coaching inn in, you know, the 1790s, you're outside the city rule. The night watchmen don't go past this wall. It's very, very different. I'm not saying it's lawless, it's more fluid. And I think there's that fluidity of thinking that you still get in this area known as the Liberties, and it definitely influenced how the firm John Power & Son evolved and how their whiskey was created and distributed. So that way for rule of law, this way for whiskey. Naturally, we were headed west to the corner of Thomas Street and Johns Lane. That's where James Power had his inn back in 1791. And like many other innkeepers at the time, he distilled his own whiskey, literally in the backyard. Out the back, he would have been distilling. And the whiskey took off. And very soon, the coaching um, enterprise was shut down to become a full-time distillery on the Johns Lane site. But the Paris family never severed their association with innkeeping or being publicans. And they kept a publican's license all the time in the distillery. And to do that once a year, you had to open a window and sell a couple of glasses of whiskey out the door to keep your license. But they always kept in touch with the publican's trade because they were very, very proud of where they had come from. James's son, John Power, founded John Power and Son with his son, James, in 1821. And the family remained in charge for generations. Thanks to Fanny Power, she had no brothers to carry on the family business. Herbert O'Reilly is her only surviving grandson. Well, she was the one who is responsible for bringing the O'Reilly family into the family firm because she married Joseph R. O'Reilly, who was my grandfather. And all her sons, or not all of them, but most of her sons, worked in the the distillery, as did her grandsons. That's why she's a legend. And she basically saved the family business because there weren't enough powers to keep it going at the time, right? (laughs) Exactly. Herbert O'Reilly never worked on John's Lane, but like many Power family members, he spent a lot of time there as a child. What was my earliest memory of John's Lane? It was going to the opening mash, okay, when all the family were invited. And one of my aunts, Aunt Janie, always put holy water in the mash to wish it luck. (laughs) Whether it was Aunt Janie's holy water or something else, the Powers had a lot of luck over the years. At one time, that distillery was one of Ireland's largest and together with the John Jameson Distillery on the northern side of the River Liffey and the nearby George Row Distillery formed the Golden Triangle of Dublin Whiskey, with dozens of smaller distilleries around them. They came and went. You know, uh, distilling was, as it is now, uh, you know, a precarious business. There were ups and downs. It didn't take a lot in the early days to open up, you know. There was no such thing as health or safety. Licensing wasn't too strict. They opened and closed, but the very large ones, the ones that resonate, like John Power and Son, like George Rowe and Co., they were all along here, and they were huge. And this is something that really distinguishes the Irish distilling tradition from other traditions, such as Scottish. In Scotland, you tend to have smaller distilleries, rural-based. In Ireland, they're almost invariably urban, and they're large. They think big, and they are large. Because they were exporting to the world at that point too, right? There isn't a corner of the globe in the late 19th century that you couldn't have got a glass of Irish whiskey. Literally not a corner. That changed with three key events in Irish whiskey history. World War I, followed immediately by Prohibition in the United States, and Ireland's own war for independence from England, with the economic blockade that followed Ireland's break from London. Irish whiskey sales plummeted, and by the mid-1960s, the industry was on life support. The Power family convinced the Jamesons and Cork's Murphy family to merge their three companies to form Irish distillers. 
At one time, the Johns Lane Distillery covered six acres between the River Liffey and Thomas Street, but as Dublin grew and the whiskey business shrank, the site contracted as more land was needed for housing. And when Irish distillers made the decision to move all of its distilling operations to the new Middleton Distillery in County Cork, the days were numbered for both the Powers Distillery on Johns Lane and the original Jameson Distillery. Jameson's closed first, with Powers closing down in 1976. But unlike many of Dublin's old distilleries, the Johns Lane Distillery is still part of the city's life today. If you walk through the stone archway on Thomas Street, like we did on a rainy Dublin afternoon, what was once the Power Family's distillery is now Ireland's National College of Art and Design. You have come in the main entranceway to the Johns Lane, the Powers Distillery, which was the heart and home of John Power and Son. And this is where all that wonderful whiskey that we were talking about in the archive originated. And it's where all these people worked. And you're walking not just in the footsteps of the Powers, you know, the family who gave their name to this distillery. You're walking in the footsteps of absolutely generations of craftspeople. You know, uh, grandfathers, sons, grandsons, cousins, people who lived and breathed their lives in this area, the liberties of Dublin, and whose descendants still live in this area because most employees would have lived locally. And it's a tribute to all of those people that we've brought you here today. And it is really significant that so many of the buildings, which were designed as distillery buildings, they've survived the test of time because of the quality of their design. And that's what we really want to show you here, is uh, to let you put your hands on what was the beating heart of Powers Whiskey. The buildings have been repurposed into classrooms and studios, and three of the old stills form a sculpture garden of sorts in the courtyard. As we walked through the campus, three students waved at Michael Carr as they passed by. In and around here you have a lot of um, artisans' workshops and stuff would have been with the distillery and now it's you know the pottery room and it's the metal working room. Some of the rooms may have been forges and metal working rooms back then so it hasn't really changed. And one of the things that always hits me when I come in here is that there's life here. You know when we were wandering around Middleton yesterday at the old distillery it is beautiful and it is, it's a fabulous uh, example of, of, a, of, a, of a, an old distillery. But if when, at certain times when there's no tourist groups going around, it's a bit, li little bit lonely. You don't get that here. I do get sad when I look at the, the stills empty, but there's life here. And even at, when the person I was waving at that walked by there, those three girls work as part of our, our advocacy team, as in, you know, they're part of an agency that go out and they do sampling on powers. And what I love about it is that those girls have done all this tour. They're not just some random people that turn up for any drinks company. Maybe they do that for other drinks companies, but for us, they, they came to me, look for training, and bring them around because they study here, and it's, it's just, it's fabulous. So that fact that that life is still here, it's different, but it's still here. In fact, some of the engineering brilliance that put powers on the map back in the day can still be seen, albeit through a few dirty windows. One of the massive steam-driven engines that helped power the distillery is still in place since the building was built up around it, complete with oak paneling in the engine room. Steam and oak don't go very well together. So what, they must have cleaned it at least once a week. Do you know what I mean? To preserve that oak panel roof, which is almost perfect. There's one little corner of it that has probably faded in the last 20 years. And the detail on that engine, that was one of the smallest engines in the distillery. It was five engines in the distillery. And that was one of the smaller ones. But it's absolutely beautiful. And you get an awful lot of industrial historians, they come just to look at this because there aren't too many left in situ. There's only really a handful. And again, we're looking at it with modern eyes, but this was a technological marvel. You would have had people travelling here just to look at it in operation and to wonder at um, the engineering that went in behind it. What I also like about this one is it is kind of presented. You know, you do have big windows. I know you can't see through them now, but you have big windows all round it. They were very proud of their yeah. technology and showing it off. You can imagine, on the day this distillery closed, that engine would have been pristine. 
Do you know they would have been yeah, suffered? I, I actually asked Barry Crockett about this because you know he not, loves his yeah. old steam engines, oh, yeah, 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 and yeah. He, he reckons history, he, yeah. he reckons if he had a couple of hours with it, he could make he it could work. get it going. Yeah. Um, but he reckons the building might uh, start to rattle apart, unfortunately. So we could also say that Powers invented steampunk. Steampunk. That's what I always yeah. describe it. If you can imagine being down here, you know, at seven o'clock in the evening on a winter's evening, and everything is moving, and everything is warm, and everything's vibrating, and there's and there's electrical light, which might not be wasn't even on the streets of Dublin at the time. You just would have been blown away by it. You know, totally blown away by it at the time. You're in the Silicon Valley of distilling. This isn't a, like a, a cutesy Victorian edifice. This is absolutely cutting edge technology designed by the best minds. It's a lot easier now than it used to be to get a look inside the old distillery. For many years, the college did not encourage visitors, but in the last couple of years, a deal with Irish distillers led to the creation of the past and present walking tour. It's a self-guided tour showing which buildings of the old distillery remain and what they're being used for today. And, of course, it's one of the highlights of the Powers Quarter. Full disclosure, I was in Dublin and Middleton as the guest of Irish distillers and the Powers Whiskey team at Pernod Ricard USA. But, as always, full editorial control over the content of this segment remains with WhiskeyCast. That's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla Single Malt. Look for the classic 16-year-old Lagavulin, the Distiller's Edition, the throwback 8-year-old, and this year's edition of the cask-strength 12-year-old Lagavulin at a whiskey shop near you. Find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, and I need to start off with the newest release from Powers, the U.S. edition of Powers 3 Swallow. We mentioned this one on the news last month, but what I did not find out until my visit to Dublin is that the U.S. export edition is different than the Irish domestic version. That one is bottled at 40% ABV because Irish law hits whiskeys bottled at higher strengths with higher taxes, which then lead to higher retail prices. So, the U.S. export version is bottled at 43.2% ABV, and it's enough to make a difference. The nose has notes of cooked banana, soft spices, honey, dried fruits, dried flowers, and just a hint of straw. The taste is smooth and creamy at first, with spices that build up to a nice crescendo and touches of banana bread, walnuts, honey, and dried flowers. The finish is long with subtle spices, balanced nicely by honey and a touch of dried flowers. I'm scoring the Powers 3 Swallow U.S. Edition a 92. Now, Powers has been bottling a number of single cask editions each year for the domestic market, and in this case, the prices are high enough to justify that higher tax bite. For instance, the 15-year-old Powers single cask that's bottled for Dublin's L. Mulligan Grocer at 46% ABV. The restaurant sells it for €25 Euros a dram, and it's apparently no longer available by the bottle. The nose is warm with mulled wine spices, soft oak, honey, and a hint of toffee. The taste has classic single pot still spices of clove, black pepper, and nutmeg, along with toffee, soft oak, and honey in the background. The spices fade away gently on the finish with touches of toffee and oak. It's excellent, and I'm scoring the Powers 15-year-old single cask bottling for L. Mulligan Grocer, a 94. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, family-owned from the start, and proud to work with other family-owned companies on the Grain to Glass project. They're working with Bex Hybrid and Peterson Farms to find unique seeds, grow them, and distill them into a special whiskey. Follow the project at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. 
Bo Moore recently wrapped up its Vintners Trilogy series with a 27-year-old single malt finished for 13 years in port pipes. It's bottled at 48.3% ABV. The nose has a nice balance of subtle pepperiness and dried fruits, along with apricots, apples, and a hint of peaches, while honey and caramel add a nice balance. The taste has dark fruits, toffee, and Christmas cake notes, along with a hint of brandy and subtle spices. The finish? It's long and gentle, and I'm scoring the 27-year-old Beaumont Vintners Trilogy a 92. One of our friends came over the other day and brought something special with him. The Nika Yoichi Salty and Peaty Japanese Single Malt, produced exclusively for the domestic market. It's bottled at 55% ABV. The nose is smoky and briny with smoked salmon, soft spices, dark honey, and toasted oak. The taste is chewy, spicy, and smoky with black pepper, a hint of clove, smoked salmon, dark honey, and toasted oak notes. And the finish is smoky, peppery, and long with notes of toasted bread, honey, and a hint of spearmint that comes alive at the end. It's really nice on a cold November day. I'm scoring the Nika Yoichi Salty and Peaty Japanese Single Malt a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,300 different whiskeys from around the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. Seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. All seems a little excessive, doesn't it? When there's one bird they really want this Christmas, red breast. The warm glow of ripe fruit, honeyed figs, and crackling cinnamon. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, and the perfect gift to slip under the tree. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Lot 40. Saw this tweet from Sarah Guerin in London, along with a photo of the third publishing of the Aeneas MacDonald classic book, Whiskey, that we talked about with Ian Buxton a couple of weeks ago, and apparently it had an impact. Here's what she says. Funny one, I was in Waterstones yesterday and spotted the below, which I don't have on my bookshelf yet. I decided not to buy it until I finish what I already have. Listening to episode number 739 on my run this morning, you mentioned it. I had to go back to Waterstones. Good move, Sarah. But why are you two weeks behind now on Whiskey Cast? I'm kidding, of course. Speaking of that, though, at Law School Drunk on Twitter has been a listener for many years but apparently has also gotten behind just a bit. I am thoroughly enjoying catching up on WhiskeyCast episodes from May 2018 to the present, listening to them while walking my kids to and from playgroup in the morning and afternoon. Hashtag paternity leave. And following our tweet the other day about the end of the Whiskey Jubilee, Anthony Rivera at Balsir on Twitter had this to say. I'm devastated. I went to this year's New York Whiskey Jubilee. It was the best tasting I had been to in years. I had planned to return in 2019. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always catch us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. Or you can just email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, brought to you by Writer's Tears. I mentioned a few minutes ago that there was a difference between the Irish and the new U.S. versions of Powers 3 Swallow because of taxes. Since Ireland charges higher excise taxes for whiskies bottled at higher strengths. Where else might you find whiskies that are different between their domestic and export versions? 
Well, this is a bit of an unusual situation where the export version of a whiskey is stronger than the domestic version. It's usually the other way around. For instance, you might remember the story back in early 2013 when Maker's Mark caught a lot of grief for reducing its bottling strength in the U.S. from 45% ABV to 42%, then almost immediately reversed that move. The U.S. government sets its tax rates on proof gallons removed from bond, not the final bottling strength, though some states do set their taxes by bottling strength. Australia, though, is one of the countries where tax rates are affected by bottling strength nationwide. As a result, Maker's Mark shipped to Australia is bottled at 40% ABV. However, it is sold in Ireland at 45%, and someone is apparently choosing to absorb the higher taxes. Here's another example for you. Buffalo Trace bourbon is also bottled at 45% ABV in the U.S., but in both Australia and Ireland, the export bottlings are at 40% ABV. And, by the way, this tax issue is completely separate from the tariffs that Ireland and the other European Union countries imposed on American whiskey exports earlier this year. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey, blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this episode of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast and our Whiskey Cast HD videos, along with the latest whiskey news, events, and a whole lot more, including a complete archive of all of our past episodes. One final reminder if you're in the Pittsburgh area, Please join us Monday night, the 26th, for our special Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel live event with the Pittsburgh Whiskey Friends. We'll be raising money for Hyas in memory of the Tree of Life Synagogue shooting victims. I hope to see you there. This is Whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch Whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.